Et, et quand même, il faut, faut saluer aussi, encore une fois la, les éditions La Fabrique, parce que c'est quand même exceptionnel d'avoir Ilan Papé, qui, qui est un grand intellectuel. Je sais qu'il y a beaucoup de médias qui nous en veulent, donc c'est un grand, grand honneur de pouvoir diffuser ça euh, sur notre chaîne. Et euh, la rencontre, elle est diffusée en direct sur Twitch en ce moment et elle sera disponible en replay YouTube. Désolée déjà au chat parce qu'on ne voit pas le chat, donc on ne pourra pas réagir vraiment au chat, mais force à vous, on est ensemble le chat. Voilà. Euh, donc ça, c'est pour euh, la présentation globale. Donc ensuite, présenter le plateau Wissam Zelka qui va animer avec moi. On va co-animer euh, ensemble la rencontre. On applaudit Wissam, s'il vous plaît. <rire> Merci. <rire> Donc Wissam, il est animateur à Parole d'honneur et il est aussi euh, streamer à la Zawa Prod. Et tu streams euh, trois fois par semaine. Bah oui, je fais ta promo. Moi, <rire> je vais pas faire ta promo. C'est gentil, c'est gentil. Merci beaucoup. Voilà. Merci. On remercie Sébastien aussi, qui est le traducteur et qui va euh, nous supporter un petit peu pendant deux heures. Voilà, merci beaucoup. On peut l'applaudir. Alors, je vais commencer par euh, présenter euh, Ilan Papé. Donc, on va commencer à présenter un petit peu Ilan Papé, un petit peu son parcours. Euh, on va revenir sur l'édition, la réédition de, de, de son ouvrage. Et ensuite, on va plus se concentrer euh, sur l'ouvrage en, en lui-même. On va explorer un peu les, les, les gros enjeux euh, du livre. Donc, voilà, j'espère qu'on aura le temps de faire le tour, mais ça devrait, ça devrait aller. Donc, euh, Ilan Papé, vous êtes un historien israélien, l'un des plus reconnus par, parmi ce qu'on appelle les nouveaux euh, historiens euh, israéliens. Vous avez été enseignant euh, à Haïfa. Et euh, vous êtes aujourd'hui professeur en Angleterre à l'université euh, d'Exter et vous êtes directeur du Centre européen pour les études, euh, pour les études palestiniennes. Vous êtes aussi évidemment partisan euh, de la lutte de libération du peuple palestinien et surtout, vous êtes l'auteur de nombreux ouvrages euh, sur l'État d'Israël et le sionisme, dont « La guerre en 1948, en, 1948 euh, en Palestine »,« Les démons de la Nakba »,« Les dix légendes structurantes d'Israël » et aussi « Le nettoyage ethnique de la Palestine », euh, parmi d'autres, euh, évidemment. Pour commencer, j'aimerais bien, bien qu'on revienne un petit peu sur cette euh, réédition aux éditions La Fabrique euh, de, de, de l'ouvrage dont il est question, euh, question euh, aujourd'hui. Ce qui est intéressant, c'est que l'arrêt de la commercialisation chez les éditions Fayard, chez lesquelles vous, étiez, vous étiez euh, édité, est intervenu au moment où euh, l'ouvrage fonctionnait bien. Il recommençait à se vendre, notamment au regard de l'actualité euh, à Gaza. Et, euh, et ça a beaucoup fait parler. En France, donc nous, on s'est beaucoup interrogé sur ça et on était très heureux de voir qu'il a été réédité aux éditions La Fabrique, où il se vend également vraiment très, très bien. Il est, il est top, 10, top 10 des ventes, des ventes on, me le, on me le disait tout à l'heure. Euh, moi, ma question, c'est est-ce que vous avez eu d'autres expériences similaires à l'international Est-ce que vous avez été surpris de ce qui s'est passé en France et, euh, et comment vous expliqueriez ce regard d'intérêt pour, pour, pour l'ouvrage yes, uh, Thank you so much uh, for all being you. Sorry for those who have to, to stand, uh, but I hope it would be worth your while, even if you are standing. And thank you for La Fabrique uh, for having the courage to publish uh, the book. Uh, surprisingly, I didn't have such an experience anywhere else in the world where the book was translated from English to uh, a foreign language. Uh, the only maybe similar case is Israel, where, uh, which France looks more and more like Israel nowadays, um, where uh, it was very difficult to find a publisher, but it was not the publisher who decided not to publish anymore. And um, why there is a renewed uh, interest uh, in the book, I think that... Uh, First of all, the title, Ethnic Cleansing, uh, relates in the minds of people to what goes on in Gaza. And therefore, it's very clear that people understand that the book provides historical context for the events uh, of Gaza. And I also think that um, especially Gaza itself is very much connected to the history of 1948. We may talk about it a bit uh, later, but you cannot understand the whole concept of the Gaza Strip without going back to 1948, because this is the year when the Gaza Strip was created. There was no Gaza Strip before 1948, 
So Gaza Strip, the idea of people living in a strip like this in under such conditions is the outcome of 1948 or the Nakba, the catastrophe uh, of 1948. Merci beaucoup. Euh, pour que le public situe un peu plus où est-ce que vous vous situez, donc on a dit que vous étiez un historien euh, israélien qui s'inscrivait dans le courant des nouveaux his historiens euh, israéliens. Et, euh, et pour que vous sachiez un petit peu, en fait, c'est un courant qui a émergé dans les années 1980, où des acteurs, des témoins, des journalistes et surtout des historiens euh, israéliens ont remis en question plusieurs des fondements sur lesquels s'était édifié l'État d'Israël, ébranlant le discours euh, dominant. Et ce courant, il est souvent présenté comme se démarquant par sa rivalisation critique euh, de l'histoire de la création de l'État d'Israël et évidemment euh, du sionisme. Et ce qui est intéressant, c'est que vous, notamment, vous vous rappelez dans, dans l'ouvrage par rapport au nettoyage ethnique, vous dites que le rôle que vous avez joué, globalement, hein, en, tant que, en tant que groupe, a été de, de, de contredire la thèse selon laquelle les Palestiniens étaient partis euh, d'eux-mêmes de Palestine. Pourtant, assez, rap assez rapidement dans l'ouvrage, vous, vous développez aussi les limites de ce courant-là et vous déclarez notamment « Mais nous, les nouveaux historiens, nous n'avons jamais beaucoup contribué à la lutte contre la négation de la Nakba. Nous avons marginalisé la question du nettoyage ethnique pour nous concentrer sur des détails. » Et moi, ma question, parce que vous en parlez aussi dans le livre, c'est pourquoi est-ce que pendant longtemps, peut-être, est-ce qu'on n'a pas cru ou entendu les Palestiniens ou les historiens palestiniens qui avaient écrit sur la, sur la Nakba et sur le, sur le nettoyage ethnique Et comment est-ce que cette historiographie autour du nettoyage ethnique a pu évoluer voilà, à travers ce courant-là, notamment Well, first of all, the uh, Palestinian historians were not heard or were silenced because this was part of the overall attitude in the Western academia towards Islam, the Arab world, what the late Edward Said called Orientalism. You didn't take seriously anything, any knowledge produced by people coming from the Arab world. In the case of the Palestinian historians, there was an additional uh, obstacle for them to be heard, and this was the, uh, you can call it the lobby, uh, the Zionist lobby, and later the Israeli lobby, that wanted to control the narrative uh, about the history of Palestine and uh, did all they could to make sure that only their narrative would be heard. And in the West in particular, for many years, they were successful in doing it. The last thing before I would go to how it developed is that the Western academic world in particular uh, desires or demands, actually, a certain uh, a s kind of sources historical sources, in order to validate a, a chapter in history. In this case, archival material. And Palestinian historians had no access to that archival material. And it was very frustrating for Palestinian historians to see people accepting, actually, their claims only after they were substantiated by Israeli historians, the new historians, if you want, the Israeli historians kosherized the Palestinian uh, narrative. Uh, it is frustrating, if I can add two sentences, because sometimes if a crime is committed and you only hear the victim, people don't believe the victim. But if the criminal admits about the crime, then it becomes a fact. The um, uh, criticism I have on the other new historians is twofold. One is that they, and also I, I myself in my earlier work, did not connect the ethnic cleansing in 1948 to the Zionist ideology. And I thought that this is uh, uh, not a good enough analysis if you don't show the connection between the ideology of Zionism and what happened in 1948, in fact, what happens today in Gaza. The second criticism has to do with the fact that I don't think you can be uh, without moral judgment of what happened. And uh, you cannot write about uh, a crime 
especially if you are part of the society that committed the crime, and not talk about the implication of the history that you are telling. This is very much allowed for anyone writing about the Shoah, the Holocaust, but it's somehow not allowed when you are written, writing about the Nakba. As for the developments recently, we have a new generation of Palestinian historians and historians who write about uh, Palestine. And they brought uh, the oral history uh, testimonies from their parents and grandparents, which helped us to fill the gaps in the story. So that's one development. And the second one is uh, many historians now are seeing the connection between what happened in 1948 to similar acts against indigenous native people in other settler colonial projects, such as in the Americas and in Australia. So it's the introduction of the settler colonial paradigm gives us a better understanding of 1948 and also of the events today. Um, <coughs> J'avais une question, mais il a déjà un peu répondu, mais c'était uh, bah, déjà pour rappeler que dans les nouveaux historiens, ce n'est pas un groupe homogène, il y a des dissensions en interne, notamment on pense les désaccords que vous avez avec l'une des figures majeures de, des nouveaux historiens qui est Benny Maurice. D'ailleurs, je pense que vous êtes certainement la figure qui est en plus en rupture avec le mythe officiel israélien. Est-ce qu'il vous a fallu bah, de ne plus pouvoir enseigner en, en Israël donc, il euh, y avait ça comme euh, remarque, et, et ça me pose la question, est-ce que maintenant, c'est possible, aujourd'hui, en Israël, euh, de faire des recherches un peu plus objectives sur l'histoire d'Israël, et est-ce qu'il existerait des nouveaux, nouveaux historiens, c'est-à-dire des, des jeunes générations qui bah, viennent un peu euh, bouleverser bah, des, des, des figures majeures comme, euh, comme Maurice et tout ça Israélien. Israélien, pardon, j'ai dit palestinien Non, non. Je... Ça. Uh, I'm 70. And I hope that when I'm 80, nobody would ask me any more about Benny Morris. <laughs> <laughs> no need to translate, I think. Uh, but uh, but it's, it's, it's a fair question. It's a fair, it's a fair question. Um, yes, we, we, I, I definitely uh, don't have much of a disagreement with Morris about the facts, but about the interpretation of the facts. So uh, it's not a matter of an argument between people who say Palestinians were not expelled and the other side says they were expelled. No, we both say that the Palestinians were expelled, but I explain it as a result of an ideology, as a crime against humanity, and he says this is what happens in war, and Israel had to do it in order to survive. And yes, going that far as I did uh, puts you in a much more direct confrontation with uh, the state, the Israeli academia, and because of that I was expelled from my university in uh, Haifa, uh, not only because I talked about ethnic cleansing, but because I challenged the very moral validity and justification of the whole Zionist project, and this is too much for the academia there to accept as a legitimate point of view. As for the question if there are new, new historians, unfortunately there are young historians who are very old historians. Uh, the whole Israeli academia is moving to uh, an area, or era rather, an age, uh, where it's very obedient to the Zionist narrative, uh, self-censoring itself. So I don't expect a lot of new good works about uh, 1948 or about Zionism uh, to emerge from the Israeli academia. There, ha there are, however, uh, Israeli historians, including young Israeli historians who left Israel and are doing excellent work to continue the research both on Zionism and on 1948 in particular. If I can add just one sentence, 
I don't know how many academics are here who are teachers, but it's very frustrating when you teach, which is what I experienced in Israel, when you are far more radical than your students. That's something even a good psychologist cannot help you. Euh, J'avais aussi euh, une question par rapport à la particularité de votre position. Donc, vous l'avez dit, vous avez été à, à, à quitter euh, Israël pour euh, l'Angleterre. Euh, et notamment parce que, c'est vrai, la, votre position est particulière parce que la société israélienne est quand même acquise euh, au sionisme. Même, on en a parlé, hein, les mobilisations en Israël contre Netanyahou, elles sont contre Netanyahou pour le retour des otages, mais elles ne sont pas forcément pour l'arrêt de la guerre. Et elles ne le sont même pas du tout, en fait. Donc, euh, donc ça, c'est intéressant. Et donc, vous êtes minoritaire. Les intellectuels comme vous sont minoritaires, même les personnalités comme vous sont minoritaires euh, euh, en Israël. Euh, et moi, ma question, c'est comment est-ce que vous en êtes euh, arrivé là euh, dans votre trajectoire professionnelle, à quel moment est-ce que vous êtes devenu... Enfin, qu'est-ce qui a fait dans votre trajectoire qu'à un moment, vous êtes passé d'un... La rupture, quoi. La Le rupture, de... quoi. Mm. Voilà. <rire> uh, first of all, I want to say there are several others uh, in Israeli society who share these views. I'm not totally alone, but we are absolute uh, minority. There's no doubt about it. Um, I think that in my case, uh, and maybe in the case of some of my friends who subscribe to similar views, it's a journey. It doesn't happen in one moment. There's no epiphany. You don't sort of wake up and uh, you become something else. Uh, uh, it's a combination of the professional career that I chose as a historian, looking at... Um, my own country's history. It's the formative year of 1948, and looking through the uh, archives and seeing things that contradicted the narrative I knew and grew up on, and uh, a certain moral constitution, a certain uh, worldview that uh, you are able to develop better when you are outside the country than within the society. So being doing the doctorate uh, thesis of 1948 outside of Israel was helpful. The fact that I did it uh, during the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982 was also a very important factor in understanding that wars can be initiated by Israel. They're not always self-defense, as they claim. And, of course, you meet, and with this I will end, I hope it's not too long, no? Uh, uh, you meet uh, outside of Israel Palestinians on a different footing. Uh, and I met uh, a lot of Palestinian colleagues and academics uh, in a different environment where we were more equal. Uh, and that also helped to, to shape uh, uh, my, my worldview. But as I say, it took time. It doesn't happen in one day. Uh, and it's a long journey. Yeah. Euh, on va parler un peu plus euh, du livre, donc « Nettoyage ethnique euh, en Palestine ». Alors, c'est un livre euh, assez dense, euh, qui est très fouillé, très détaillé. Où il y a beaucoup de pages où vous montrez euh, la destruction de certains villages, où vous montrez les exactions qui ont été commises, ce qui a été détruit, les, les, les terres volées. Euh, moi, ce qui m'a particulièrement marqué en lisant ce livre, c'est que ça traite de, de 48, mais en fait, en réalité, quand on lit, on voit que c'est totalement d'actualité. Et pas seulement avec les événements récents, c'est d'actualité dans le sens où, dans ce nettoyage ethnique, il y a des, des choses, des événements qui hantent Israël, mais il y a aussi des logiques idéologiques qui traversent encore l'État d'Israël. Et donc, c'est encore plus d'actualité maintenant avec le massacre en cours. Et moi, j'avais une question pour commencer. Je sais que voilà, ce que vous appelez le nettoyage ethnique, c'est ce que les Palestiniens appellent la Nakba. Et il y a un discours palestinien qui parle même de, de Nakba perpétuelle. Euh, Est-ce que là, avec ce qui se passe, on pourrait parler d'une nouvelle Nakba ou alors d'une Nakba perpétuelle, mais avec une intensité euh, plus grave Oui, tout d'abord, je pense que c'est vrai que les méthodes kind de of, uh, policies et méthodes que l'Israël utilisait en 1948 et la logique derrière ces actions uh, sont répétées aujourd'hui. Je vais vous donner juste deux exemples. Un uh, est the uh, perception of any civilian space in which the Palestinians live, 
be it a village, a, a neighborhood, they are perceived or are looked at as a military basis or an enemy basis. And therefore, this is not a place where women, children, and old people, non-combatant, if you want, live. It is the whole village, the whole neighborhood, is the enemy territory that has to be destroyed. This was very clear in the orders that the Israeli army gave to its troops in 1948, and it repeats itself uh, now uh, in the orders that the Israeli army is giving the troops uh, in Gaza. Um, the second uh, uh, example is the uh, international uh, reaction. Uh, uh, it was a bit more forgivable in 1948. There was no television, no internet. Uh, it took time for uh, news to arrive outside of Palestine. But of course, it's much less understandable today when people can watch daily the genocide on their smartphone, television, uh, and internet. But the international reaction of the governments, of the mainstream media, was very uh, similar. And uh, one can add two additional points which are important. One is the uh, narrative the Israelis provided to the world and to themselves, or why are they doing what they are doing, is very similar in 1948 to today. And this is by connecting the Palestinian resistance to Nazism, to uh, classical anti-Semitism, or to Islamic fanaticism. Uh, these elements as explaining the Palest what they would call the Palestinian violence that justified the Israeli violence was already present in 1948, and it of course plays a very important role in the narrative of Israel today. Uh, uh, the second uh, one uh, is the total support of the Jewish society to the actions. Uh, it is very worrying when you think that it's not because Israeli Jews in 1948 did not know about the ethnic cleansing, or that the Israeli Jews today don't know about the genocide. It, uh, that is, this is the reason that they are supporting the government. They know and they don't care. And this dehumanization uh, is very typical to settler colonial uh, movements and the way they look in the indigenous uh, native people. You ask whether it's, uh, uh, as they say in Arabic, al-Nakba al-Mustamira, the ongoing Nakba, or is it a very different uh, chapter in the Israeli uh, actions against the Palestinians? I think it is part of the ongoing uh, Nakba, because like settler colonialism, the actions of the settler community against the native people are what we call in history a structure. It's a structure. By this we mean that uh, the same ideology uh, uh, is the motive for the actions against the Palestinians. The nature of the action changes according to the historical circumstances, the level of Palestinian resistance to these actions, the attitude of the region, the attitude of, of the world. But um, this is uh, uh, another chapter. I would add that unfortunately, in the case of Gaza, and I'm afraid also in the future in the case of the West Bank, ethnic cleansing apparently is not doing its job as far as Israel is concerned. The job it was supposed to do is to have as much of Palestine as possible with as few Palestinians in it as possible. But it's not enough to do it through ethnic cleansing, and that's why I think Israel is now using genocide as a way of achieving its main goal, or the main goal of the Zionist movement from its very inception to have as much of Palestine as possible, with as few Palestinians as possible, so that Israel could create a viable, secure Jewish state. 
uh, and the legality or legitimacy, not the legality, the legitimacy of genocide in Israeli discourse now, uh, the legitimacy of genocide as an action on the ground, the ability of Israel to tell people in France not to use the word genocide is very worrying that this is now the main Israeli tactic. Moi, ce que j'ai beaucoup aimé dans, dans l'ouvrage, c'est la façon dont vous démontrez, vous faites une démonstration de la planification du nettoyage ethnique. C'est-à-dire, ce n'est pas arrivé comme ça en 48 ou, ou, ou beaucoup plus tard. Ou, voilà. En fait, c'est vraiment une, une construction, un projet qui a été planifié. Et dans le détail, on voit les pages où il raconte, par exemple, les dossiers qui sont réalisés sur les villages palestiniens. Ils sont très transparents. Très transparents, voilà, sur le fichage des, des Palestiniens pour savoir où sont les résistants palestiniens, dans quelle famille, qui a participé à telle révolte de 36, etc. Et donc, ça, j'ai trouvé ça très intéressant. Et vous dites, vous affirmez, euh, vous affirmez dans l'ouvrage, le paradigme du nettoyage ethnique doit remplacer celui de la guerre. Et ça, je trouve ça très intéressant parce que le paradigme de la guerre, moi, je le comprends comme ça, c'est celui qui est sioniste, c'est celui qui dit, voilà, tout ce qui nous arrive, toutes les guerres qu'on mène, c'est seulement parce qu'on nous attaque. C'est toujours la faute des Arabes, c'est eux qui nous envahissent, euh, bah, par exemple, en, 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 en 40 euh, en, 40, en 46, après le, le, le plan de partage, ils disent, voilà, il y a eu l'invasion arabe qui sort de nulle part. Alors que non, il y a le plan de partage, ensuite il y a les révoltes, il y a les, il y a les, il y a les révoltes, et il y a un début d'exode avec 75 000 Palestiniens euh, qui s'en vont. Et donc vous vous dites là, il faut ren renverser le truc et dire, on n'est pas dans un paradigme de la guerre, mais on est dans un paradigme de nettoyage ethnique, où donc il y a une explication en fait sociologique, académique, qui permet de dire, bah, en fait, il y a une construction sociale qui fait de, dans l'autre camp aussi, on prépare la guerre en fait. Et moi, je veux savoir pourquoi est-ce que le, la formule des, de nettoyage ethnique, vous l'avez choisie Qu'est-ce qui vous permet de comprendre à l'histoire de, de la Palestine, euh, notamment parce que c'est une, une catégorie juridique aussi, nettoyage ethnique, pourquoi pas une autre euh, voilà. Je ne sais pas si c'est clair. Um, the term that people used until I wrote uh, the book was uh, the Nakba, the catastrophe. And the main uh, worry I had about this term, although I respected that this is how Palestinians are relating to that year, that uh, the problem with this is that catastrophe uh, can be a natural catastrophe. You, it's, it, you don't have people who are responsible for the catastrophe. You only have victims of the catastrophe. And I thought this was not explaining well enough Uh, not only what happened, but also what can happen. And therefore, I was looking for a term that uh, explained what was the main motive uh, of the Zionist movement behind uh, the actions they took in 1948. Um, the great scholar of uh, settler colonialism, Patrick Wolf, the late uh, a scholar. He used to say that um, when settlers like the Jews who came to Palestine, settlers who came to America, to Australia, were usually refugees themselves, uh, victims themselves of persecution. Uh, there were people that Europe didn't want, and they wanted to create a new Europe elsewhere. But they chose places where somewhere else already lived. And the encounter between these outcasts from Europe and the local indigenous people, in his eyes, created what he called the logic of the elimination of the native. And I was very uh, aware of this uh, idea. And I thought that elimination is not always genocide, as happened in North America. Maybe there are other ways by which such settler movements are getting rid of the local population. And ethnic cleansing, when I looked at the definitions in the state, even the State Department definition, which I bring in the book, or the United Nations, or the scholars, fitted exactly to what uh, happened in Palestine, from the beginning of the planning of the operation to the very last stages by which the ethnic cleansing uh, entity tries to erase the memory of those that were ethnically cleansed and removed. I just want to add that one of the other reasons, or the other reason I used the term ethnic cleansing was 
that the language used in 1948 by the Israeli generals that planned the operations against the Palestinians included in many cases the word to cleanse uh, in Hebrew. They were talking about cleansing, uh, the word in there's no Hebrew, it's called letaher, to, to uh, cleanse uh, the village, to cleanse the, um, the city. And some of the operations, they gave all, uh, every, every attack on, on a city or a town or a number of villages had a code name. Operations had code names. And some of them had code names that had the word cleansing in it. Not ethnic cleansing, of course, this is not the word, but cleansing. Uh, and uh, it was very clear that uh, this was not coincidental. It's not a computer that chose these names. These are the people who were behind the operations who used this, uh, uh, these ideas. Um. Il y, a, il y a aussi une, comme, comme tu l'as dit, Mariam, euh, ce qu'on remarque dans le livre, c'est que c'est pas un incident de l'histoire, c'est pas quelque chose que, en fait, Israël aurait voulu éviter de faire, mais qu'ils ont été contraints de faire à cause des menaces extérieures, mais qu'en en fait, ça découle de l'idéologie sioniste, euh, qui a une vision ethnique, en fait, euh, des populations. Et d'ailleurs, c'est assez euh, euh, marrant, entre guillemets, de voir que bah, toutes les démocraties soutiennent un pays qui a vraiment une conception ethnique. Euh, de, de ce qu'elle est, de son identité. Euh, et, et justement, euh, voilà, a, on voit que ce qui hante vraiment les dirigeants sionistes, c'est la question démographique. Et en fait, on voit que euh, l'idéal, dès le départ, même s'ils acceptent le plan de partage de manière pragmatique, euh, dès le départ, ils ont vraiment l'idée d'un État qui serait dans l'idéal exclusivement juif, ou au pire, mais vraiment au pire, à 60% juif. Et justement, est-ce que... Euh, L'une des questions majeures qui, 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 qui traverse le, les dirigeants israéliens même, mat, même euh, maintenant, ce n'est pas en fait la question euh, démographique. Oui, je pense que chaque projet settler colonial project is working in deux dimensions l'espace uh, et la population, ou si vous voulez, la démographie et la géographie. Vous venez à un nouveau pays. You want to have the space without the people on it. And whenever you acquire more space, you have more demographic problems or challenges. So this is why the obsession. What is so particular about Zionism, which is not typical to other settler colonial movements, is that ironically, they were so obsessed with the number of Palestinians who would be not only in Palestine, but under their own rule, because they wanted to build a democratic state that is Jewish. If you want a Jewish democracy, you need a Jewish demography. And uh, uh, it was very clear that even under the partition plan that was mentioned, if not one Palestinian would have been removed by force from Palestine, Whatever would have been the borders of Israel, in the first Israeli elections, the Jews would not have been the majority. So for the sake of democracy, they explained to themselves, we need to expel the Palestinians. It's a bit like the United States and Britain bombing Iraq in order to make it a democracy. Mais justement, pour euh, rebondir sur ça, il y a aussi euh, euh, une figure qui traverse tout le livre, c'est Ben Gurion. Euh, alors, ça repose beaucoup sur son journal. Et euh, donc, c'est l'un des acteurs majeurs de ces nettoyages ethniques. Euh, il faut reconnaître à Ben Gurion qu'il euh, il est extrêmement pragmatique, il est très stratégique, il est très froid. Euh, il sait comment remplir les, les objectifs. Et il y a quelque chose que je trouve très intéressant, c'est euh, l'idée de moment opportun. C'est-à-dire que c'est là qu'on voit euh, euh, les décisions d'Israël, par exemple, d'accepter, euh, de faire comme s'ils acceptaient le, la partition, mais de profiter d'un moment pour procéder à ce qu'ils avaient en tête, c'est-à-dire le nettoyage ethnique. Et on voit ça tout le long d'Israël, ce côté vraiment pragmatique. Est-ce qu'on pourrait faire le, le, la même chose Est-ce qu'on pourrait faire le même parallèle avec l'actualité C'est-à-dire que 
il y a eu euh, le, le, les attaques du 7 octobre. Euh, Israël euh, a voulu se venger, mais en même temps, euh, s'est dit que c'était le moment opportun pour remplir des objectifs euh, bah, de reconquête de territoire et de, euh, bah, on le voit, d'essayer de faire vider la population dans les autres euh, États arabes. First of all, I remember that uh, in 2010, I wrote to the mayor of Paris, or maybe it was one of the mayors of one of the uh, quarters. Uh, they called an avenue, uh, boulevard after Ben Gurion. <laughs> and I wrote to, to him, he was a man, I remember, that there, he's going to name a street after a war criminal and uh, Maybe he should think twice about it. Uh, he actually responded with the 10 pages uh, history of Zionism in Israel going back to the Holocaust. So I decided not to continue the correspondence. And I think there is a Ben Gurion uh, street of Bel. You can, there is. So I failed. I failed. Um, Yes, I think that uh, he was very clever in uh, exploiting the, the historical moment. Uh, today, again, it's the same but a bit different. Um, you're right, the, uh, the 7th of October, in the eyes of particularly the new kind of Zionism we have, the Messianic Zionism, the one who won the elections in November 2022, the one that probably have the support of 60 to 65 percent of the Jews in Israel. For them, this is an historical moment to be able and uh, take over the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, uh, and uh, create the new Jewish kingdom, which will be more theocratic, with very little, with a very uh, small number of Palestinians in it. Uh, and uh, that is how they see the opportunity uh, that the Hamas attack on the 7th of October provided them. In fact, there are a lot of, I will just want to add two things about it. One is that because of that, in Israel there is a, a growing sense that there was a conspiracy on the 7th of October, and time will tell whether it's true or not, but there are some troubling indications that at least partly it might be true, that the army was not, did not interfere in the attack of the Hamas, although it was able to, in order to give the opportunity to do what Israel has been doing afterwards. The very troubling questions of why the army was not doing anything for eight or 10 hours when he was already uh, there. Uh, I'm not saying it's true, I'm not saying it's, it's a lie, I'm just saying that even people in Israel think that it's used as an opportunity by that particularly kind of uh, uh, messianic Zionism. The second thing I want to say is that 10 days ago, the lobby for this messianic Zionists had a big meeting in Jerusalem, led by the Minister of National Security, Tamar ben the uh, Minister of Finance, uh, Bezalel Smotrich, uh, and other leading members of parliament and cabinet. They were detailing the plans for Jewish colonization in the Gaza Strip, which included the removal of the population of Gaza to Egypt. They even hinted that they have an agreement with the Egyptian president, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, about building a huge uh, mega city for refugees in the Sinai. But what is interesting and troubling, they were also saying that they are preparing to build Jewish settlements in the south of Lebanon, because Israel is going to invade the south of Lebanon and push the Hezbollah to the north of the river Litani. And for them, if the river Litani is the border in the north, Jordan is the river, Jordan River is the border of, uh, in the east, the sea in the west, and the Sinai in the south. This is more or less the recreation of the biblical kingdom 
that they want always to build. And, what, and I would add that this also includes ideas of how to replace Al-Aqsa Mosque with the Third Temple of Jews. Mais justement, ça me permet de, de rebondir sur ça, sur l'invasion du Sud-Liban. Euh, ce, ce qui amuse beaucoup dans le discours d'Israël, c'est qu'aujourd'hui, bah, par exemple, on dit qu'Israël doit, doit mener cette offensive, c'est le discours officiel, pour éviter sa destruction, euh, parce qu'en en fait, il y aurait une menace existentielle, alors que dans les faits, euh, bah, on assiste plutôt à la disparition de la Palestine, et euh, à la fortification de l'État d'Israël. Et ce qui est intéressant, c'est aussi pour faire un parallèle euh, en, en 48, c'est qu'on voit qu'il y avait aussi le même discours qui était euh, donné. Euh, et même, je pense que beaucoup, dans l'imaginaire commun, quand on parle de la Palestine, on a aussi cette impression-là que, bah, en fait, il y avait une offensive arabe euh, extrêmement forte à l'époque, euh, et que, bah, euh, voilà, à la guerre comme à la guerre, Israël a dû se défendre. Mais en fait, vous montrez que, un peu comme maintenant, à l'époque, ce n'était pas du tout le cas, qu'il n'y euh, bah, euh, avait pas vraiment de coalition arabe forte et que même certains États arabes ont joué euh, double jeu. Oui, c'était pour voir si c'était vrai. Effectivement, est-ce qu'on peut faire le parallèle avec les, les trucs de maintenant Est-ce qu'en euh, en fait, il y a toujours le même discours de la menace existentielle d'Israël, euh, alors que dans la réalité, Israël semblait savoir que rien ne, ne, ne le menaçait dans son existence I think it's a bit different. Uh, we should differentiate between the fact that Israel claims that the genocide is an act of self-defense. That is not an act of self-defense, it is genocide. On the other hand, I do think that the way Israel acts is constituting an existential danger for Israel. Uh, it is now putting itself in a position that would make it very difficult in the future for Arab rulers and regime to normalize relations with it. It makes it uh, difficult for the international legal tribunals, as we have seen, to be silent about what it is doing. It makes it very difficult for Jewish communities around the world to support it. And we see that the young Jewish generation, in particular in the United States, are now criticizing Israel, are distancing themselves from Israel. And uh, it really uh, narrows or downsizes the alliance that gives Israel its power to exist. And this is only part of the problems that Israel has. It also has internal issues and economic issues. So I think that um, not the Israeli action is not in order to survive, but it contributes significantly to its own demise. Uh, I don't know if the Israelis realize it or they don't. And I don't say it as an activist. I say it as a scholar, as an academic who has been analyzing Israel for many, many years. Sur l'ONU, moi j'ai une question sur l'ONU. Oui. Euh, moi je voulais revenir sur euh, la responsabilité de l'ONU, après aussi des, de, de, de l'Angleterre, mais là en l'occurrence de l'ONU. Euh... Oh non, le truc pédage s'est décollé. <rire> la responsabilité de l'ONU dans le nettoyage ethnique. Euh, tout simplement parce que vous dites que ce plan de partage-là, quand il est voté en, en novembre 1947, euh, euh, vous dites qu'il y a, il y a une, une atmosphère, une conviction que la partition signifiait l'affrontement total. Et aussi, vous reprochez à l'ONU, euh, et notamment avec la résolution euh, 181, qu'elle n'a rien prévu pour prévenir ou empêcher le nettoyage ethnique, là où, dans les discours dominants, on entend souvent « oui, c'est la faute des Palestiniens, ils n'ont pas accepté le plan de partage, etc. etc. » Là, vous dites à l'inverse comme ce plan de partage, il est profondément injuste, euh, antidémocratique, etc., bah c'est la source de ce qui va suivre ensuite. Est-ce que vous pouvez expliquer en quoi est-ce que, est que ce plan de partage-là, il a été dévastateur pour la suite Yes, first of all, it's true that uh, one of the uh, most important Israeli claims that is even accepted by some friends of Palestine 
is that the Israel accepted the partition plan and the Palestinians uh, rejected it and that's why uh, the conflict in a way uh, continued. That they missed an opportunity, the Palestinians, to have a state of uh, their own. And it's very important to, to debunk this uh, uh, myth because it's not, uh, it's, it's not the way things happened. Um, first of all, we have to remember that the United Nations in 1947, when the partition plan was uh, adopted, did not represent the colonized world, only the colonizers. The only uh, decolonized uh, member state was Liber Liberia. And uh, therefore, this was a United Nation that very much justified anything that British Ang Anglo-French colonialism or Western American imperialism wanted to happen in the world. So that's one thing to remember. This was not the United Nation that in 1975, when the decolonized world was represented in the General Assembly, equated Zionism with racism, which was much more reflective of the global attitude to Zionism than was the partition resolution. So that's the first point. The second point was that the United Nations understood from the very beginning that the Palestinians are not going to accept partition. It doesn't even matter if the Palestinians were right in rejecting or not. Uh, I think they were right in rejecting because there was no reason for them to give half of the country to a movement of settlers, most of whom arrived just a few years earlier on. So it's not surprising to me that they did not accept. But that is even not relevant to the way the United Nations behaved. If you have two groups of people, one is two-thirds of the population, and one is one-third of the population, and the two-thirds of the population say, we don't accept your idea of a solution, you don't say, OK, you have to accept it, and we are not going to do anything else anything more. This was ridiculous. If the Palestinians did not accept the partition, they had to continue the negotiations until they reached an agreement. In fact, as I show in the book, the American Department, State Department, the Foreign Ministry of America, was following this logic. And when the Palestinians said no to partition, they said, OK, let's hear the Palestinians. And they talked to the Palestinians, unlike the British or the French or the others. And the Palestinians told them, what we want is a democratic state in Palestine. A one democratic state in Palestine. And for a few weeks, this was the American position. People don't know it. It was the official American position. Because the American State Department was made in those days, unlike today, of diplomats who had a lot of experience in the Arab world, spoke Arabic, knew the Arab world, and believed in democracy. And therefore, they thought this is a legitimate Palestinian demand. But under the pressure of the Zionist lobby in America, and because it was an election year in America, the president at the time, uh, Harry Truman, uh, did not allow this to be the official American position for too long. So the United Nations, if I summarize, it's a responsibility. First of all, it's responsible for not going on with a peace program that would be accepted by both sides. Secondly, in its own peace program, it uh, was it stated that it will be responsible, it, it will, as an organization, it will be responsible for the life, property, and dignity of the people of Palestine, whatever is going to happen. And they didn't respect their commitment. So it's an organization that served Western ideas, try to impose them on the Palestinians, 
and didn't do anything when this imposition became ethnic cleansing. Je voulais continuer sur ce sujet avec juste une petite question. Vous montrez aussi qu'à l'époque, les États-Unis, pendant un temps très court, ils ont été plutôt favorables sur la question des, des réfugiés avant que ça change. Euh, comme vous dites, il y a la question des élections, il y a la question du, euh, du lobby sioniste qu'il y avait aux États-Unis. Il y avait aussi, euh, bah, on était en 48 et c'était euh, euh, trois ans après euh, la Shoah, donc il y avait euh, une sorte de grande culpabilité qui faisait que euh, autant les... Euh, euh, les États euh, comme euh, les Britanniques euh, avaient un peu du mal à réagir euh, que même les instances internationales. Euh, par contre, est-ce que euh, ce qu'on voit aujourd'hui, c'est que bah, 70 ans après, il y a toujours la même apathie. Euh, L'ONU euh, condamne, mais il n'y a pas vraiment d'actions qui sont menées. Et on voit que les démocraties occidentales continuent à afficher euh, dans leur majorité, même s'il y a des exceptions, un soutien à, à, à Israël et que parfois, bah, on peut ne pas comprendre, parce qu'on se dit que ça peut aussi desservir tout le discours occidental qui se dit euh, pro-démocratie, pro-liberté, euh, euh, du côté du droit international. Donc la question, est-ce que vous avez une explication de pourquoi ces États occidentaux continuent à maintenir un, un soutien à Israël, malgré les, les horreurs qu'on qu voit tous uh, called Lobbying for Zionism on both sides of the Atlantic. And it's a very long book because it needs a, a very detailed history to explain why this kind of uh, exceptionalism and immunity is provided by uh, the West uh, to Israel. It's uh, something that developed historically uh, in Europe 150 years ago. Uh, in America 100 years ago, uh, and it has, because it has been there for so long, first of all, it's very effective. When a lobby exists for very long, it doesn't have to work hard anymore. It means that French politicians, German politicians, British politicians, American politicians know exactly what is expected from them in the policy towards Israel, even if the lobby does not pressure them directly. So that's the first point, to understand that uh, uh, it's, it's a very old project. Secondly, it's important to understand who is behind this project of lobby, which I try to show in the book. One important group is evangelical Christianity. Not all the evangelical Christians, not all the Protestant Christians, but the very important stream in Protestant Christianity, in evangelical Christianity, actually uh, conceived the Zionist project even before it became a Jewish project. The reason, maybe some of you know, that they believe that what they call the return of the Jews to Palestine is, uh, will bring back uh, Jesus Christ, the resurrection of the dead, and uh, the beginning of the end of times. So there, first of all, there is a theological group of Christians who to this very day, and already in the mid 19th century, believe that supporting Israel or supporting, not only supporting the idea of a Jewish state, but making the Jewish state uh, viable is a religious imperative. And as we know, in America, this is not a small group. This is a very large group of Americans who, who believe in it. Uh, and there are also people who believe in it in, in Sweden, in Germany. There are Christian Zionists everywhere. Uh, I found out recently even in Malaysia, among the Chinese Christian community there. So that's one group. It's a powerful group. The second group that supported Zionism and made sure that governments in the West do not uh, uh, deviate uh, uh, from a pro-Zionist and later pro-Israeli policy are the uh, leaders of the Western Jewish community. Now what is also so interesting about the leaders of the Jewish communities 
and I'm going to be a bit controversial, as if all my life I'm conventional. Um, the leaders of the Jewish community in France, in Britain, uh, in the United States, never saw themselves as people who would like to live in Palestine. The reason at the very early uh, days before the Holocaust, but even after the Holocaust, that they wanted Jews to go to Palestine was the great fear that the, where anti-Semitism was very strong, Central and Eastern Europe, would push Jews to the West. They didn't want the Eastern European Jews to come, to, especially to Britain and America. It was particularly true about Britain and America. So you have a very powerful Jewish communities who, yes, they suffer from anti-Semitism, but they are part of the elite. They are part of the political elite. They are part of the cultural elite. They are part of the economic elite of the West. In fact, they are an important part of these elites. And they want the Jews to be in Palestine, but not their, their kind of Jews. Uh, there's a famous, there are famous conversations between the early leaders of Zionism with British and American politicians whom they try to convince to support the idea of turning Palestine into a Jewish state before it happened. And they, and, and they tell them, you know, if you don't help us to create a Jewish state in Palestine, all these East European Jews would come to you, and they are poor, and they are Bolsheviks, and, and they are going to cause trouble. So that's the second group. I will call it the Jewish aristocracy or, or elite. The third group, which developed, of course, a bit later, but and changes through history, but it's the same group. It's the, I call it the colonialist imperialist support for Israel. Either for, you know, in the past it was colonialism, British colonialism, French colonialism, who saw the Jewish state as an asset, uh, both because of Islamophobia, uh, but also because of anti-Semitism. You, you know, you, you will have a Jewish European state in the Middle East, which is better than having a Muslim state in Palestine, and you won't have the Jews in, in France. This is the best thing for anti-Semites, is uh, to support Israel as long as the Jews of France are prepared to go to Israel. Otherwise, Anti-Semitism is not working. <laughs> then it became imperialism with America, seeing Israel as the, an imperialist bastion, as the last base against uh, barbarism in the Arab world. And imperialism is made of uh, multinational corporation, military industry, security industry. So you have these three pillars, maybe, you can call them, three pillars that ensure constant support for Israel, unconditional support for Israel, which is important, not just support, unconditional support for Israel. The, uh, the Christian Zionists, the Jewish communities, and you can call it the military industrial complex, you can call it the politics of imperialism, but it's, the same, it's a more cynical, it's not ideological, uh, although it has some ideology in neoconservatism, but it's mostly not ideological. It's very practical uh, uh, support. Now, what an academics have to do, and they're not always doing it, is to differentiate, to separate between the narrative and the reasons. What do I mean? I read a lot of, also here in France, people saying, well, you know, people support Israel because of the guilt complex of how France behaved during uh, the Shoah, the Holocaust. Definitely, you hear in Germany people saying, what do you expect us after what we did uh, to the Jews? We, we have to support Israel. This is not the reason. That's what I'm trying to say. This is the excuse. The reasons are nothing to do with the guilt complex, to my mind. The guilt complex is weaponized in order to say, you know, don't talk to us about Israel because you know we are guilty for what we did to the Jews. So you have to understand us. So even if we support the killing of children in Gaza, you have to understand that because of the Holocaust, we have to support the killing of Jews, uh, children in Gaza. Now, of course, if you stop for a moment, 
If you stop for a moment and you say to them, you know, this doesn't sound logic, what you're saying. They say, yes, it's nothing to do with logic. It's guilt complex. I think we have to make sure that we expose the real reasons and separate them for the excuse people giving. You know, sometimes individuals explain their actions and they believe that they have the, a genuine explanation, but that doesn't mean that it's the real explanation, you know? You can do something very bad and you say, oh, no, no, I'm doing it for the benefit of the society. Uh, we, we know this from private life, that we are sometimes explaining. And I think that is very important. That is very important to, to explain because it comes to the heart of the conversation today in French politics about anti-Semitism. Uh, I, I don't understand French, but I understand enough to know that this is the most idiotic <laughs> debate I ever heard in any civilized society. I never heard so many nonsense and idiotic ideas thrown to the air about anti-Semitism as if this is issue number one between the left and the right and the center in this uh, country. Uh, but you understand where it comes from. It comes from people don't want to talk about the real racism in France, which is Islamophobia and Arabophobia, not the hatred of Jews. It comes from the problem that France, like the rest of Europe, never wanted to solve the Jewish problem on European soil. If the French and the German felt so guilty about what they did to the Jews, and they liked the idea that the Jews would have a state, give them Alsace-Lorraine. <laughs> Why are you giving them Palestine? <laughs> this, this is why they're doing this. It's nothing to do with anti-Semitism. This is all a trop uh, that is not going to do, uh, allow people to, to deal with the mediocrity of the politicians and their inability to deal with the real issues. But I'm transgressing. I, like, I, I always, when I talk about politics today, I, I can go until the morning, so I'll stop here. Bonne yeah. chance, traducteur. Alors, je ne sais pas combien de temps il nous reste. Euh, moi, j'aurais une dernière question. Mariam aussi. Et je ne sais pas si on aura le temps de faire le public aussi. Peut-être deux, trois questions. Mais alors, vraiment, vraiment courtes. Ouais, court. Tu veux poser... Euh... Vas-y, commence. Moi, c'est sur le... les réfugiés palestiniens et le processus de paix. Ouais, Ça va Vas-y. Okay. <rire> je valide. Tu <rire> valides, c'est bon <rire> euh, Moi, j'aimerais bien que vous rendiez compte de l'importance de l'enjeu du droit au retour des réfugiés palestiniens, parce que c'est la question du nettoyage ethnique de, 1900, de 1948, c'est la question vraiment centrale, et c'est la revendication euh, des, des, des Palestiniens, et notamment des Palestiniens de 1948, euh, et, et même de plus tard. Et ce qui est intéressant, ce que vous montrez bien, notamment dans le dernier chapitre, c'est à quel point est-ce que cette question-là euh, fait peur aux sionistes, à quel point elle a été mise de côté et esquiver dans tout le processus de paix, à chaque fois qu'il y avait des processus de paix, et notamment les accords d'Oslo, et c'est pour ça que ça a été reproché à Arafat d'avoir euh, accepté les accords d'Oslo, alors qu'il mettait de côté euh, la question des, du droit au retour des réfugiés palestiniens. Donc ça, c'est une question qui revient tout le temps. Pourquoi est-ce que c'est si central, et pourquoi est-ce que ça fait aussi peur euh, à Israël et aux sionistes, euh, la question du droit au retour bah, je, je vais poser la même, parce que c'est dans, ah, dans la même langue. Euh, en fait, quand on lit le, le livre, il y, a certains, il y a un discours qui va dire « Bon, c'est bon, c'était 48, c'est passé, euh, les réfugiés, ça fait 70 ans, il y en a beaucoup, en fait, c'est des fils de réfugiés, donc il faut passer à autre chose. » Et vous, euh, bah vous n'êtes pas du tout d'accord avec cette idée, c'est ça Et pourquoi vous n'êtes pas du tout d'accord avec l'idée de... Il faudrait peut-être passer à autre chose sur la question des, des et réfugiés. Pour, et même, ils disent, pour arriver à la paix, il faut arrêter avec cette question des réfugiés. Et c'est ça. Et après, euh, après 1967, après la guerre de 1967, justement, euh, après, les, les sionistes insistaient pour dire on ne touche pas aux acquis de, 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 de avant 67. On ne va pas revenir sur ça. Et même, on va même revendiquer encore plus de territoire. Voilà. Uh, first of all, it's important to remember that uh, quite a few Palestinians are refugees inside historical Palestine. 70% uh, of the people of Gaza are refugees. 
So when we call, talk about the right of return to the places from which they were expelled, uh, we are talking about a change in the whole nature in the relationship between Palestinian and Jews, first of all in historical Palestine. If you object to their right of return, and I'm not talking yet about how to uh, implement it, but if you object to their right of return, it means that you want the status quo to continue, namely the apartheid state of Israel to continue. So the, first of all, the discussion about the right of return is connected to the discussion about the future, the nature of, of the state. Uh, if the state is democratic, and is part of decolonization, and as part of reconciliation, then the right of return is a natural part of it. If you want to continue the apartheid regime, the colonization, of course you object to any change in the reality, including that of the return. So that's my first point, that uh, uh, we don't start with the right of return. We start with the question, what is the nature of the regime between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean? Is it an apartheid state or is it a democratic state? And that changes very much the discussion about the right of return. In a democracy, the question would be practical. How to do it? Can we do it? In an apartheid state, the question is ideological. We're against it. We don't even want to discuss it. So that's my first point. The second point is that uh, in order to bring an end to a situation in a place like Palestine, and you really want to build a new reality which is better for everyone, what we call reconciliation, not peace. Peace is not a relevant uh, word for Palestine. But reconciliation, like they tried to do in post-apartheid, South Africa, you have to rectify the past evils as much as you can. Let's talk about South Africa. What Desmond Tutu suggested is that I cannot, I don't want as a new South Africa to bring to trial all the criminals who were doing terrible things to the African in South Africa during apartheid. I prefer a truth and reconciliation committee. Namely, I want these people to admit the wrongs that they did, and in this kind of Catholic Christian idea, or maybe even Anglican, I will absolve them. You know, that's, that's one way, good or bad, but it's, it's a different approach to reconciliation. In the case of Israel and Palestine, you have to have a closure and you have to uh, admit uh, the ethnic cleansing of 1948, and you have to find a way of correct the injustice that was done to the Palestinians. And therefore, in principle, you have to accept the right of return so that you show that you are A, acknowledge what happened, and B, you know who re is responsible for what happened, and thirdly, that you want to think about how to make it more just. Now, the international law has a lot of procedures of how to allow people to return without violating the rights of the people who already live in the place. It's not something that has not been uh, contemplated or discussed. We have United Nations principles of how to implement right of return. We have case studies of right of return in many places. So, you know, people invested so much time and energy in building war uh, machines. Uh, they can invest two years in how to integrate uh, refugees back to a country. It's possible. The moment you are not a racist, because if if the state of Israel continues to be a Jewish racist state, it doesn't want the Palestinian refugees to return, not because there's no place, or it's not practical, because they don't want Palestinians. They are busy expelling Palestinians, let alone 
allowing new ones to, to, to come back. So, so I think this is, um, for me, this is the core issue of the problem. It's the core issue of the problem. Uh, a, a, a Palestine or a discussion on Palestine in the world that would start with the, how to make the Palestinians, how to enable the Palestinians to return is the beginning of the right conversation about Palestine. And I compare it to the wrong conversation we had. The wrong conversation is the one we had for 56 years, maybe even from 47, about the two-state solution. The two-state solution was the wrong conversation, unfortunately supported by some Palestinians as well, very important Palestinians. Uh, but the two-state solution was based on the idea that a racist apartheid Israel can be only in part of Palestine. That's okay. <laughs> That's the idea of the two-state solution. And that was the wrong conversation. We wasted 56 years at least on, you know, there's this Jewish saying, we were looking for the key where there was light and not where we lost it. And we lost the key in the right of return. And the light was the two-state solution, but there was no key there. And I will stop because I can see that I'm getting <laughs> excited by my own metaphor. And God knows where it will take me, so I will, I will stop here. Yeah. Je pense qu'on commence tous à avoir un peu chaud. Je propose qu'on fasse deux, trois questions maximum. Peut-être qu'on fait les, les trois questions d'un coup. Ça te va et tu les traduiras après. Euh, alors, s'il vous plaît, faites des, des questions courtes, plutôt courtes. Je, je sais qu'il y a beaucoup qui voudraient réagir, mais ce n'est pas le moment. Euh, bonne chance, Omar, pour choisir parce qu'il y a beaucoup de monde. Aïe, aïe, aïe. Je gère. Oh. Beaucoup de mains levées. Je peux la poser en anglais ou bien il faut la faire en français Ouais, en français, comme ça, il y a aussi des gens qui nous regardent. D'accord. Merci, professeur. Je voulais juste savoir, est-ce qu'un Israël post-sioniste est envisageable et est-ce que la, la, la solution d'un État pour tous avec des égalités de droit est réaliste La deuxième chose, c'est une information, c'est une annonce que je vais faire. Les éditions de la guillotine se préparent à publier le livre de Ilan Papé et de Ramzi Baroudi qui s'appelle « La vision que nous avons de la libération » et ça se fait par, participa par financement participatif. Donc, si vous pouvez bien aller et en précommande, si vous pouvez aller au, sur le site « Les éditions de la guillotine vous, », vous commanderez le livre et il pourra être euh, publié en juillet. Merci. Euh, bonjour, je vous remercie pour la parole. Je suis membre du collectif BDS, Boycott, Désinvestissement, Sanctions. L'idée, un petit peu, c'est ça, c'est la fin de la colonisation, la fin de l'apartheid et le droit au retour des réfugiés. Je voulais juste savoir, Monsieur Papé, que pensez-vous du boycott Beaucoup de personnes pensent que ce n'est pas efficace, que ce n'est pas utile, que ça ne marche pas, mais au fur du, de, de l'histoire, que pensez-vous voilà, du boycott Est-ce que c'est vraiment une arme à laquelle on peut utiliser Merci beaucoup. Une autre question Oui, il y en a. <rire> Je vais ici et après à vous. Euh, bonjour et merci. Ma question, c'était plus... Euh, pour, pour ces derniers mois, je pense qu'on a tous eu des moments de grand désespoir sur le sujet. Et je pense qu'en France, ces dernières semaines, c'est le cas aussi. Et je voulais savoir si vous, vous aviez de l'espoir pour l'avenir, si rejoint un peu ce que vous disiez aussi, je pense. On fait les réponses et après on... Ou, ben ouais, on va faire deux slaps parce que là, c'était ah ouais, bien là. Okay. De ça. Après, c'est bon. Hein ouais, on en a fait trois et on fera une, deux, une deuxième pour terminer. Parce qu'on ne savait pas qu'il y avait autant de questions. D'habitude, les gens sont timides, mais là... Uh, as for the first uh, uh, question, uh, I, I think it's uh, is something, it's a vision that first of all has to be accepted by the liberation movement or the Palestinian liberation movement as its main vision. This is not yet the case, one should say. So the chances for a, a one-state solution depend a lot on the ability 
of the Palestinian liberation movement itself to be united, to have a consensus, and to push forward for such a solution. If this will happen, I'm very optimistic that this could uh, 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 unfold, not immediately, but uh, in the longer term, because we already have a one state, but we have a regime which is not democratic uh, in the one state. So we need actually not to build a new state, we need to change the regime in the one state. And uh, this is possible if the liberation movement would uh, uh, take it a, as a project. And then it becomes practical because this would be the Palestinian demand. If the Palestinians are still broadcasting in, uh, in part of their leadership support for the two-state solution, uh, then of course there will be no two-state solution and not one-state solution, but the continued of the Israeli apartheid state uh, 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 until something dramatic uh, is, is, is happening. So I'm, I'm optimistic that the younger generation of Palestinians are far more united, are far more pro one state solution, but they still need to have the organization and the structure to carry it forward, but I'm very hopeful about them. Uh, as for the, the, the BDS, the boycott, I think it is effective. I think it's a very important uh, movement. I think that uh, until uh, the 7th of October, uh, it was able to persuade the civil society to do the B and D in the BDS, the boycott and the divestment. But they didn't succeed, or we all did not succeed, in uh, getting to the S, the sanctions. There is an indication that we are moving in that direction. We're not there yet, but we are moving in that direction. Because I believe that the reason the International Court of Justice was willing to discuss Israel, uh, uh, the, the Israeli policy in Gaza as genocide, and the reason the International Criminal Court was willing to discuss Israel, Israeli leaders as war criminals, something that was unthinkable, both things, would be totally unthinkable 10, 10, 15 years ago. The reason they did it is not because are not only legal, because these bodies like the ICJ and the ICC are not just professional bodies, they're also very political bodies. And until recently, the politics of the ICJ and the politics of the ICC was following the positions of the governments on Israel. I think what they did in, in both tribunals was to say to the politicians, we waited a long time for you to change your policies on Israel, uh, w which is what many of people in your societies demand from you to do. But you're not doing it, so we are doing it. And I think that's one station that history would look back and say, this was an important stop on the way of convincing, first of all, governments in the global south to impose sanctions. We already have some cases. Colombia stopped uh, uh, exporting coal to Israel. Uh, Turkey downsized its trade with Israel. These are just the early birds of something that will uh, uh, continue. The big question is the global north. Will it ever impose sanctions on Israel? But this was also the big question with apartheid South Africa, and eventually it happened. So I think the BDS is very important. It has a lot of work still to do. And I think, uh, tragically, the horrible things that happened since the 7th of October gave new life to BDS, gave new life to the student movement uh, in the world supporting Palestine, and therefore I think it will be a very effective tool in the future. On va faire euh... On continue avec les questions. Oui. Ce sera les trois dernières questions et on conclura l'émission. Oui, euh, rapidement. D'abord, euh, j'aimerais te remercier 
vivement pour votre intégrité en tant que chercheur et pour votre courage de prendre position pour la justice. Maintenant, merci beaucoup pour tous ces éclaircissements. Euh, J'ai une question en deux, en deux parties, c'est vraiment lié. Hein. Euh, à un certain moment, vous avez évoqué que le euh, gouvernement actuel, c'est un gouvernement d'extrême droite et de messianique euh, qui, est, qui est dogmatique et qui est en train d'aller euh, euh, dans une démarche sans issue, étant donné qu'il ne trouve pas de solution. Euh, et euh, que ça va provoquer des euh, contradictions au sein de la société israélienne. C'est là que j'aimerais que vous détaillez un peu plus. Euh, euh, comme par exemple, on peut identifier le manque de confiance avec, avec l'armée, le manque de confiance avec le gouvernement et les institutions dans les, euh, maintenant. Euh, on peut citer la... Euh, l'augmentation de euh, départs à l'étranger. On peut citer également la, la, la manière que le gouvernement euh, traite la question des prisonniers ou otages, euh, notamment en utilisant euh, parfois la doctrine Hannibal, la, la, la doctrine Hannibal que vous connaissez, qui consiste à... Euh, euh, frapper et les otages et les Palestiniens qui sont avec. Mais est-ce que, ici, c'est la deuxième partie de la question, est-ce que euh, cette, ce gouvernement-là messianique, dogmatique, euh, voyant la fin qui s'approche, n'est pas capable, et avoir, ayant la, la bombe atomique, n'est pas capable de commettre un Hannibal terminal au final euh, en éliminant les Palestiniens, même s'il va éliminer un, une petite partie des Israéliens. Et comment on peut aider à ce que ça ne se passe pas Merci. Merci. Bonjour. Euh, déjà, merci pour tout ce que vous faites. Euh, J'ai une question très courte. C'est sur la... Comment est-ce que... Très concrètement, vous expliquez la passivité des pays arabes de la région et même du Maghreb. Euh, passivité, euh, complicité, silence, enfin, tout ça. Et une dernière question. Ah, Oula. Ah, fait... C'est toi qui choisis. Hein. Qui a la plus courte ah. Qui paye un abonnement à PDH <rire> Qui est abonné Voilà. <rire> Bonjour, merci beaucoup pour euh, cette conversation extrêmement éclairante. Je voulais revenir sur ce que vous avez dit. Je, je, je précise tout de suite, ça ne va peut-être pas être au centre de la conversation, mais vous avez dit que la, le, les positions sur l'antisémitisme en France étaient imbéciles et idiotes. Euh, pour autant, elles sont en train de euh, durablement euh, instaurer un climat extrêmement toxique, à la fois politique, idéologique, mais aussi existentiel pour beaucoup de personnes. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous en dire plus sur la façon dont vous considérez ce, ce, cette position Et euh, comment est-ce qu'on pourrait sortir en fait, de l'impasse, euh, voire du piège dans le, lequel on se trouve, euh, notamment dans une période comme celle-ci, où il y a, comme vous le savez sans doute, des élections, et que euh, les fascistes sont à la porte du pouvoir en France Donc, euh, on aurait vraiment besoin de votre éclairage sur comment éviter le piège de l'accusation d'antisémitisme. Merci beaucoup. Okay. On oublie. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I, I, I at least understood that part. Um, yes, we have we have uh, almost something like a civil war going uh, on within the Israeli Jewish society. In my writings lately, I called it the war between the state of Judea and the state of Israel. The state of Judea is the one that was born uh, in the settlements and is the messianic Zionism that we already talked about with its vision of uh, a theocratic Israel 
all over Palestine without Palestinians and, and so on. I don't want to repeat it, but that's, that's the one. And the other one is the more liberal Zionists, secular Jews, who do not object to the apartheid nature of Israel, but want the Jewish society to enjoy pluralism, liberalism, LBGTQ uh, 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 rights, and so on, uh, that has a kind of a model of liberal democracy, but only for Jews. And they are fighting each other very seriously now. And this is a serious uh, conflict that I think the state of Judea is going to win. And uh, it, because it already has taken over many uh, positions in the army, in the secret service, in the Mossad, uh, and in the government. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, I think they are taking Israel into this, in a ve into this uh, a future uh, where uh, a lot of Israelis who do not agree with them would leave. Uh, since the 7th of October, more than half a million Israelis left Israel. All of them, I say it without checking, but I'm sure, all of them belong to the state of Israel, not to the state of Judea. So it means that the number of Israeli Jews willing to fight for what I call the liberal apartheid Israel is going down. So it's, a f it's an important question, the, the internal, and it has a lot to do, I don't have the time to go into it, with the, the failed attempt to define Judaism as nationalism. It doesn't work. Islam is not nationalism, Christianity is not nationalism, Buddhism is not nationalism, and Judaism is not nationalism. And it doesn't work, uh, even if you uh, have a state that claims to be uh, uh, Jewish. Will, it, will they use nuclear weapons as a final? I mean, there are not cases. Uh, I wouldn't uh, put it beyond them. Uh, uh, people uh, in the West say that uh, they are worried about uh, the Iranian uh, bomb. I'm much worried about the Israeli bomb. Uh, and uh, yes, this is very frightening. What can we do uh, uh, against it? What we are doing here? I mean, we, we have to... Uh, persuade the people who can make a difference in politics, in culture, in the world, in the region, that Israel is a danger to itself, to the Palestinians, to the region, and to the world. And for that, we know exactly what should be done, but our politicians don't listen to us, but they don't listen to us about what do they listen to us about? <laughs> Global warming, poverty. They don't, in any case, uh, politicians don't really, in this particular age of ours, are not at all interested in the people. They are totally interested in themselves. Again, I won't don't transgress in this, because you're going to have uh, a TikTok a poster boy as a prime minister, and I hope to visit you every now and then to, to comfort you of your choice. Um, the second uh, 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 the point, I transgress and I forgot the point, just give me a cue. The Arab states. Well, politics in the Arab states is also not something, as they say in English, to write home about, right? The Arab world has rulers, but it doesn't have leaders. It used to have leaders. Oh, the Arab world has quite formidable leaders. The liberation movements used to have leaders. We don't have leaders in the Arab world. We have rulers. It's not the same thing. And because of that, it's easy to persuade them that not supporting fully the Palestinians would help them to survive or it will be the door to America, or whatever explanation they give themselves or people give to them. But we should draw some optimism from the fact that they don't represent the people of the Arab world. The people of the Arab world are pro-Palestinian. In Morocco, in Algeria, in Egypt, 
uh, in the Gulf. People, the people of the Arab world are pro-Palestinians. And the leaders who are not leaders but rulers uh, do not represent the people, not again, like in France. They don't represent them on many issues, not only on the issue of Palestine. That's why Palestine is so important. It represents everything which is wrong with our political systems in the world and everything that could be good with our political systems. And that's why so many people know about Palestine in places where they have no idea where Palestine is geographically, but it is a symbol of the struggle for uh, justice. Uh, the third question. Oh, anti-Semitism, how to deal with anti-Semitism in France, right? That was the question, right. Uh, I'm not going to give you advice. You are French and I'm not, and I'm, I, don't, uh, I don't know. Uh, you probably know better than I do what, what to do. I would only say that one of uh, the best manipulation uh, uh, Western democracies are able to impose on their people, and this was very cleverly and accurately analyzed by, by Noam Chomsky, is the ability to provide the agenda of the day as if it's the only possible agenda. So you're already within the agenda. If you're thinking out of the agenda, you are probably either unwell uh, or you are an enemy of, of the state. Uh, so there's no way out of it. The agenda is, is the wrong one. It's very clear to us. The agenda is racism, not anti-Semitism. Racism is a problem in many societies. Uh, in some societies, it is leg legalized. In some societies, there is legislation against racism, but in practice, the police, the courts, uh, and uh, the universities are practicing de facto racism. Uh, racism is not just about uh, uh, ethnicity, religion or nationality, there's also racism against workers, there's a racism against people who are not like you. Uh, societies are working very hard to uproot racism, but if they are not talking about racism in general, but they are creating this idea that there is a table of racism, one racism is particularly bad, anti-Semitism, the rest are bad but not as bad. Uh, this is not going to work. This means that there is no, this is not a serious discussion and there is no genuine wish to get rid of it. Too much of it is used for political power or to defeat another political power and not to deal with the question itself. Uh, you know, you don't have to be a genius to understand it, but I come back to this point and with this I will end this. Uh, I really don't remember uh, an age where we had such mediocre politicians. Uh, really, uh, uh, not only in France. Uh, you're, not, you're not alone. <laughs> you're not alone. Uh, they are so self-centered. They are not very articulate. They are not very intelligent. They are not very educated. It's, it's like we decided that politics is such a, a low human uh, uh, profession that we send the worst kind of people to deal with it. Uh, whereas we need the best people in our society to be there, and they are not there. So we, we have a huge problem as a civil society with political systems that do not represent us. In 2008, some people tried in the West to, to change it by, by mini revolutions. France is the land of revolutions. God knows, maybe, maybe you'll do it again for us, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's really uh, 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 something that only in a global alliance of people who are not served by their political systems, uh, it can be defeated. Not in a local, to my mind, the local forces are not powerful enough to change their own political systems. What you need is a global movement. Uh, of change, and uh, we once used to call it the left, but what is left of the left? I don't know. <laughs> once we call it communism, what is communism today? 
But these were the impulses of people who talked about global revolution. They, they felt that this is never a local thing. It didn't work, we have to admit. But uh, maybe we have new ideas, but uh, this is, it's not an advice. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's like a preacher. I, I, I send you to your Sunday weekend with food for thought, but not more. I'm sorry, not provide something better, yeah. <laughs> Ah d'accord, on m'entendait pas. Euh, alors plusieurs choses à dire. Tout d'abord, il y a les livres de la fabrique euh, qui sont en vente. Euh, oubliez pas, il y a Nettoyage ethnique de la Palestine, le livre d'Hélène Papé. Aussi, je pense que la fabrique, c'est certainement l'une des maisons d'édition en France où il y a vraiment euh, un, une riche collection sur la question de la Palestine, que ce soit sur BDS, que ce soit notamment aussi sur la question un État, un livre qui est sorti il n'y a pas très longtemps, peut-être un an. Donc vraiment, euh, je ne sais, je sais pas si c'est euh, s'il y en a là-bas à la table, mais il y en a aussi sur le site Internet pour pour ceux qui nous regardent en ligne, si vous voulez vraiment explorer tous ces sujets, euh, allez visiter le site de La Fabrique. D'ailleurs, je voudrais aussi qu'on remercie encore une fois La Fabrique pour nous avoir permis d'avoir cette discussion. Et on rappelle, on rappelle, on rappelle... On rappelle le courage des éditions de la Fabrique. Je rappelle qu'il y a une pression énorme, notamment par les choix éditoriaux qu'ils font. Alors là, il y, avait, il y a Ilan Papé. Avant, c'était Andreas Malm. Donc euh, vraiment, il faut, il faut les soutenir. Euh, je, il, faut, il y a Auria Boutelja. Euh, <rire> il y a aussi le magazine Nous qui est en vente euh, derrière. N'hésitez pas à en acheter, ne serait-ce que pour nous aider, parce que comme ça, on n'aura on pas de carton à porter. Donc, s'il vous plaît, n'hésitez pas à vider les numéros. Sur, euh, vous pouvez aussi les commander sur Internet. On est en train de faire les envois. Désolé, c'est un peu long parce qu'il y a énormément de numéros et on est une petite équipe euh, de bénévoles. Et je rajouterai aussi en annonce, donc demain, il y a une émission PDH, euh, notamment avec Ousmane Timera, où on va parler des musulmans par rapport aux élections. Et mardi, il y a un retour exceptionnel. Ils nous ont boudé, ils nous ont boudé pendant un certain temps parce qu'ils avaient du succès. Ça leur est monté à la tête. Il y a le retour de Tzedek qui va faire une émission à Olam Mazet mardi en studio avec Enzo Traverso. Voilà, donc mardi soir, on peut, on peut applaudir aussi le travail de Tzedek. Stylé, stylé. Et je terminerai, je, je voudrais qu'on applaudisse beaucoup, énormément aussi l'équipe technique qui a fait un travail exceptionnel. Et le relais pantin. Et le relais pantin aussi, et qui nous permet d'avoir ces événements. On rappelle que, par exemple, Judith Butler, c'est grâce à eux qu'on a pu la recevoir au final, malgré les pressions. Sur ce même fauteuil. Voilà, sur ce même fauteuil et tout. Voilà. Merci à tous. Merci encore, Hélène Papé. Merci Sébastien, Sébastien aussi. Sébastien pour la traduction. Merci beaucoup. Et à très vite. Au revoir. Ouh.